This module is an introduction to the field of behavioural economics from the perspective of impact evaluation and economic policy. Behavioural economics studies individual preferences and the rationale behind observed choices. Most individual actions are driven by a combination of factors, psychological, social, cognitive, even emotional factors play a role. Behavioural economics identifies which of these factors are most relevant to individual choices and tries to integrate them in the microeconomic models that we use to describe the individual's actions. In the 19th century, John Stuart Mill coined the concept of Homo economicus, a representative optimising individual who is narrowly self-interested and consistently rational from the perspective of classic economic theory. In 2002, Daniel Kahneman and Vernon Smith shared the Nobel Prize in Economics for showing convincing empirical evidence that the so-called rationality of the Homo economicus was absent from most human behaviour. It turns out that individuals often do not optimise. In fact, we tend to make systematic optimization mistakes. The good news is that we are not completely self-interested and we do take into account our environment and people around us when we make decisions. The common agreement is that behavioural economics shows that individuals are systematically not rational. I disagree with this vision. My opinion, and you can disagree with me without consequence, is that behavioural economics shows that our theoretical models are systematically wrong. The challenge that we face is to adapt our models so they are able to predict behaviour while remaining mathematically tractable. The message I would like to convey in this module is that you can use the tools from behavioural economics to collect empirical evidence on why a programme, a treatment or an intervention works. A small behavioural experiment could help you test part of your theory of change or your chain of results behind an intervention. This module is an introduction to some core concepts from behavioural economics, but it is also the closing chapter of this training course in impact evaluation. We will take a step back to have an overview of all the evaluation methods we have discussed and discuss their position in the experimental spectrum. You will see some examples from the literature to illustrate three types of behavioural tools, laboratory experiments, field experiments, and a type of experiments called nudges. The general objective of experimental methods is to identify causal relationships as cleanly as possible. Think about a horizontal line defining the degree of exogeneity of a treatment from 0 to 1. 0 being an observational study where you observe treated and untreated units in their natural environment, and 1 a perfectly exogenous treatment that is randomly allocated. At zero, you have all kinds of selections into the treatment. The treatment status is completely endogenous. On this side of the spectrum, you have impact evaluation methods such as matching methods and diff in diff. They both use observational data that is subject to strong selection bias. At 1, you have the randomised control trial method, in which treatment and control unit are perfectly randomly assigned by a computer-generated pseudo-random number. At 1, on the right-hand side of the horizontal line, you have perfect treatment exogeneity. In a perfect RCT, you could measure treatment effects by a simple comparison of means between the treatment and the control group. 
Natural experiments will be somewhere in between these two extremes. There is a randomness component that splits units into a treatment and a control group. Depending on how exogenous you think the event is, you can move a little to the right or to the left of the line. Natural experiments are quite often analysed by using instrumental variables and adding some controls. Then you have the regression discontinuity method. I will argue that RD is to the left of natural experiments in the randomness spectrum. Although the exact value of the cutoff may very well be random, there might be a correlation between the running variable and the outcomes. There is some selection bias overall, but as we get close to the cutoff, the units are similar enough to be able to compare them. In my scale of randomness, RD is between matching and diff in diff which use observational data and natural experiments. Now imagine a vertical line going from 0 to minus 1 that measures realism. 0 being the real world with no interventions from the evaluator and minus 1 the most framed, sterilised, controlled environment in a medical experimental laboratory. In this module, I will call behavioural experiments hypothetical framed situations, in which individuals make decisions and we make inference about a treatment effect in a controlled environment. Treatment assignment may be as random as in an RCT, but the environment is much more controlled and less realistic. In the experiments that I call behavioural experiments, subjects make decisions that are not necessarily part of their day-to-day -day decisions. Moreover, they know they are part of an experiment. The most controlled environments are called laboratory experiments. The most realistic ones, in which units do not know they are part of an experiment, or whether they are part of the treatment or control group, are called field experiments. There are all kinds of experiments in between. Generally speaking, some of the advantages of laboratory experiments and framed experiments are they take place in a very controlled environment with little variation of potential confounders, which makes it easy to identify small treatment effects. We can study the details of human and social behaviour because we can control many variables that affect the outcome of interest in real life. Behavioural experiments are also relatively inexpensive compared to, let's say, randomised control trials in the field, in which you test the impact of treatments or programmes on real-life outcomes like consumption, education, nutrition, violence, etc. The main drawback of behavioural experiments is that they take place in a very controlled environment and thus the results are difficult to replicate in real life and, of course, have limited policy relevance. It is hard to control real life. All the variables that we can control in the experiment may play a much larger role and may be more important determinants of an outcome. Let me introduce my first example, the gender wage gap. There is a consistent gap between men's and women's wages all over the world. On average, there is a difference between a man's and a woman's aggregate wages or salary. This gap is persistent when other factors are adjusted for education, experience, parents' education, and so on. As an example, in the OECD countries, a group that covers all rich countries in the world, the gender gap in median earnings is almost 15% for full time employees. On average, men get a gender premium of 15%. One of the hypotheses that have been proposed to explain this gender gap is that men are more competitively inclined than women. Some people think that a part of this gap reflects intrinsic differences in preferences. Three economists, Uri Gnizzi, Kenneth Leonard and John List, designed a behavioural experiment to explore the role of nurture on this preference gap as opposed to nature. The idea is that culture might be critically linked to competitive inclinations rather than a natural or innate tendency 
for men to be more competitive. Their theory is that boys are encouraged from an early age to be more competitive than girls, and this reflects on their preferences and their wages in their adult lives. The authors use a clever experimental task to provide some insights into the reasons behind the observed differences in competitiveness between men and women in the Western world. In fact, Gnesi and List wrote a general audience book discussing some interesting experiments in this subject. It is called the Y axis. Gnesi, Leonard and List conducted their experiment in two distinct societies. The Maasai in Tanzania are a good example of a patriarchal society where males dominate. For instance, most female Maasai are required to seek permission from an elder male before they travel any significant distance, seek health care, or make any other important decision. In contrast, the Kasi in India is a quite particular matrilineal society. Among the Kasi, inheritance and clan membership always follow the female lineage through the youngest daughter. The experimental task was to toss a tennis ball into a bucket that was placed three metres away. They were informed that they had ten tries. A successful shot meant that the tennis ball entered the bucket and stayed there. Participants were asked to choose the manner in which they would be paid for their performance. The two options participants were asked to choose between were a specific amount of money X per successful shot, regardless of the performance of the participant from the other group, with whom they were randomly matched. This is a non-competitive payment mode. Or B, three times that amount of money, 3x, per successful shot, if they outperformed the other participant. This is a competitive payment mode. In this experiment, participants earn a reward for their performance. They can earn a much bigger reward if they also outperform a randomly chosen competitor. The results from this experiment show that in the patriarchal society, the Maasai, men opt to compete at roughly twice the rate as women. Interestingly, this result is reversed among the Kasi, the matrilineal society, where women choose to compete more often than Kasi men. The authors of this study interpret this result as evidence that gender differences in preferences for competitive environments is a matter of culture rather than nature. Culture and behavioural traits seem to influence economic outcomes. The policy implications, at least in my interpretation, are that the gender wage gap can be addressed by giving similar encouragement for competitiveness to boys and girls at an early age. What is interesting about this experiment is that it gives us an insight into the reasons, the mechanisms behind an observed economic fact that is the gender wage gap. The gender pay gap may not be totally explained by cultural differences. There may be many other variables involved. But this experiment shows empirical evidence pointing towards one of the explanations. Experiments are usually fun to do, and this is a good reason to be interested in experimental economics, at least I think so. However, I would like to add a word of caution about economic experiments. You need to have economic theory, or at least an economic question, behind each experiment you conduct. It is not a productive practice to conduct experiments just because you can. In the previous example, there is an economic interest behind measuring the causal effect of cultural factors on preferences for competitive rewards. You need an economic reason or a policy question behind your experiment. 
This type of experiment is extremely interesting and useful for understanding human behaviour and social interactions, but their use for policymakers is limited. Randomised control trials and field experiments are more realistic. This push for realism stems from the concern that policy-oriented treatments need to work in the real world. One of the concerns regarding laboratory or framed experiments in the field is that if subjects know they are being studied, or if they sense that the treatment they received is supposed to elicit a certain response, they may express the opinion or report the behaviour they believe the experiment wants to hear. A good example of a naturalistic, unintrusive field experiment was conducted by Bertrand and Mullinathan. They wrote a paper called Are Emily and Greg More Employable Than Lakeisha and Jamal? A Field Experiment on Labour Market Discrimination. Again, discrimination is a concern and a subject of interest for economists. There is a racial wage gap and a racial employment gap in many countries. This experiment focuses on the United States. Behavioural experiments become more scientifically interesting when they answer questions that cannot be answered with observational data. In 1998, a black person in the US was twice as likely to be unemployed than a white person. If you ask employers if they discriminate, the most prominent response will be no. However, you don't know if this is because they do not discriminate or because discrimination is known to be a wrong social behaviour. This makes observational data unsuitable for testing the effect of race on employability. To circumvent this difficulty, Bertrand and Mullanathan conducted an experiment. They sent resumes responding to job postings in two cities in the United States and measured the callback rate for each resume. They fictitiously manipulated the perception of race via the name of the fictitious job applicant. It turns out that in the United States, there are white sounding names such as Emily Walsh or Greg Baker, and there are African American names such as Lakeisha Washington or Jamal Jones. In their experiment, they sent the exact same resume with the same experience, same education, same age, gender, etc. The only thing that varied was the name of the applicant to suggest race. They found that white sounding names received 50% more callbacks than African American names. This racial gap seems to be present across occupation, industry and employer size. The policy implications of this experimental results are that training programs alone are not enough to alleviate the racial gap in labour market outcomes. At this point in the course, I hope you are convinced that a valid identification strategy is your best way out of unobserved confounders and selection bias. This is not an easy task. It is one thing to be aware of the assumptions required for each evaluation method to be valid, quite another to be able to recognise which assumptions may come into play in a given empirical application. In this course, we have discussed several forms of experimental and non-experimental methods to be used to solve the endogeneity problem under the label of program evaluation tools. We discuss randomised selection, which is the preferred identification method, as well as other methods that expand the domain of what may be regarded as quasi-experimental tools for identification purposes. Identification opportunities arise when interventions follow an assignment rule imposed by the government, an institution, or when treatments are given by exogenous events, whether natural or man-made. The Vietnam Lottery Draft, the assignment of Indian local governments to be headed by women, or the change of an immigration restriction can be classified as experimental studies in their source of identification. Nonetheless, most natural experiments need to be supported by additional econometric tools to properly identify causal relationships. Natural experiments can be used as instrumental variables or can be exploited through flexible mean regressions 
such as in the regression discontinuity method. Matching and difference in difference methods solve the identification question from a completely different perspective. Diff in diff cancels out the selection bias under the common trend assumption. Matching methods try to avoid the selection bias by controlling for observed characteristics. From this particular module, we conclude that there is an interest for social scientists to conduct laboratory experiments in controlled environments. A practical advantage of delivering treatments under controlled conditions is that you can more easily measure individual behaviour and responses 